So we come back to this diagram here. We've seen this before. I told you there were four enzyme systems that, um, that molybdenum is critical in playing a role for. And one of them, um, this xanthine oxidase system, which is how we metabolize uh, chemicals down into uric acid. So I want to talk a little bit about, about some of this. So there's one other thing to consider around molybdenum in cancer, which is um, there's this region in China where the soil levels of molybdenum are extremely low. This region has um, 10 times the esophageal cancer rates um, of the rest of China. And, and the suspicion here is that it's because molybdenum is so low and it's not as available. Now, the mechanism there is not really quite known, but there are a number of researchers that have studied this epidemiologically. Okay, so back to the roles of, or the functions of molybdenum and the reason why it's essential, these four primary pathways. I want to dive in a little bit deeper to some of these pathways here. And so if we look at this nice set of diagrams from the Linus Pauling Institute, you'll see here one of the functions of molybdenum is in the sulfur amino acid metabolism. Now, I, I referred to this earlier uh, as I was talking about sulfite turning into sulfate, which again, sulfate is relatively a harmless compound. Sulfite not so much. This can trigger a number of different types of symptoms in humans, and this is especially true as it relates to um, foods that are preserved with sulfites. And this is true of things like wine. So if you've ever drinking a bottle of wine, or not, not, not even necessarily a bottle, but a glass of wine, and you have the tachycardia or the face flushing, and you don't do very well. Symptomatically, this may be actually not the alcohol or the wine itself, but actually the sulfite that is used in preserving the wine. We also see this in a number of processed foods, processed packaged foods. And the term that we're looking for when you're reading a food label is, you'll see this word sulfite, but a lot of times you'll see another term, metabasulfite. That's the same, basically, for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. Sometimes you'll also see this term, we split the word bisulfite as an additive in food. So if you find that when you eat foods that contain sulfites, metabosulfites, bisulfites, it's very possible if, that you might have a problem with molybdenum. Again, if we look at, at this pathway, molybdenum works right here. Um, in this, with this enzyme system right here called sulfite oxidase. So molybdenum drives that enzymatic system. As we were talking about earlier, methionine and cysteine are the two amino acids. So as you're breaking these down, they will break down into sulfite. And if you lack molybdenum and this enzyme doesn't work well, you're not going to get to sulfate. And then you're going to have the potential for a increased symptom profile that makes you feel bad. Right, so that's again one of the functions of of molybdenum as it relates to the metabolism of the sulfur-containing amino acids. Now, on that same note, we'll come we'll come back to this diagram. There's a really good article that was published um, not very long ago on on this very thing. Right, sulfite sensitivity and unrecognized threat is molybdenum deficiency the cause. So. Um, these researchers uh, point at several different key things out that I think is important for you to know. Number one, what are the common symptoms of sulfite sensitivity? Wheezing, labored breathing, chest tightness, cough, faintness, extreme shortness of breath, respiratory arrest, loss of consciousness, blue discoloration of the skin, flushing, swelling or angioedema, breaking out in hives, edema in the throat, as well as low blood pressure, generalized itching, contact dermatitis, episodic swelling of the hands and the feet, as well as the eye areas, mood changes, clammy skin, abdominal cramps, nausea, diarrhea, and, and as bad as anaphylactic shock, which is a dangerous thing. And so is this, some people would look at these symptoms and they would say, wow, these really look like what? It looks like food 
allergy, possible food allergy. Well, it's not, you know, food allergy is classically defined as an immune response where, where you have IgE production and histamine release. And histamine intolerance looks a lot like sulfite intolerance, symptomatically speaking. So, but this, in this case, this is possibly not a food allergy, but possibly a molybdenum deficiency that's causing it. So something to consider, uh, again, especially if you are exposed to or exposing yourself to, to foods or items that have high sulfate or sulfite rather uh, content. Now there's other possible causes of sulfite sensitivity. You can see here, um, they go on to discuss um, the, the problem is that with a lack of molybdenum, you can't metabolize sulfite to sulfate. Going back to this diagram, sulfite to sulfate. So that's the possible cause. And then you also have something else to consider. Beyond the foods, the processing items that contain sulfites, you also have a number of medications or drugs that contain sulfites as well. And so this is a list of some of those Medication. So you can see here some common antibiotics like gentamicin and Bactrim can contain sulfites. And many people have recorded or reported these types of symptoms after using these types of antibiotics. So again, the question is, do you have an allergy to the antibiotic or do you have a sulfite sensitivity? And that's, you know, that's a question that molybdenum might be able to answer you know, for many of you. You've also got a number of other medications here, Novocaine, uh, different types of morphine, as well, and then moving down the list, there's a number of other drugs that are used, ironically used in, in treating asthma or in treating you know, airway disease that have sulfites that can create a lot of the symptoms, respiratory arrest, uh, shortness of breath, same symptoms as asthma. So check your medications and look for sulfite. If you find that you've got a history of possibly reacting to them, you might also consider molybdenum in that scenario. Okay, back to some of the other functions of molybdenum. So there's this other aspect of molybdenum that's important in what we call uric acid production. Now, many of you may have heard of uric acid. It's the chemical compound responsible for gout. So what happens is uric acid crystals will form and they'll lodge in the big toe. Sometimes they can lodge in the ear or in the elbows, creating these um, crystal, like these little tiny crystals can stab your tissue basically in a nutshell, creating pain and inflammation. And this is gout. Now the way this is diagnosed is a lot of times is the doctor will run a test that measures uric acid levels in your blood um, or even uric acid levels coming out of your body. And, and you know if these are really, really high, it's potential possibility um, that gout might be uh, that m gout might be part of your problem. But also, one of the things they can do is they can do an extraction of fluid from your joint, and they so they take a needle, fine aspiration, and they they stick it in your joint. And they extract the fluid, and then they take that fluid and put it under a microscope, and they use a special type of lens called a birefringent lens and they're looking for uric acid crystals that would signify that your joint has got uric acid in it, uric acid crystal deposition in it, i.e. diagnosing you with gout. Because there's certain medications that will block these enzymes right here. Um, these enzymes are, again, responsible for breaking down your, your, your DNA byproducts, right? So uric acid... Um, is broken down. You've got adenine, which is, which is a purine that breaks down into subsequently uric acid through these molybdenum-based enzymes. So these enzyme systems here, these three, xanthine oxidase, aldehyde oxidase, um, and, and, and another xanthine oxidase, these three enzymes in this pathway are molybdenum uh, dependent. So without molybdenum, they won't work as well, and so you can get backed up. So molybdenum is important for your body's ability to break down adenine, which is, a by, again, a byproduct of the breakdown of DNA. And, um, and it's important for a number of other different functions. But your body 
cycles it down into uric acid, at which point you secrete or excrete the uric acid from your body. Now, there are a number of things that can elevate uric acid as well, where, whereas molybdenum helps the body convert adenine down to uric acid so you can excrete it in the urine. There are also a number of foods that are high in these compounds, so that can lead to elevations of uric acid as well. So if you have gout um, and your uric acid levels are high, this may be one of those times where you're not really considering taking a lot of molybdenum you know, as an extra course of supplement because it accelerates this path to uric acid. And if you've already got high levels of uric acid, it's very, it's very theoretically possible that molybdenum might exacerbate that particular illness. So those of you with gout, maybe look at, at molybdenum with a grain of caution. Now, let's look at some of the other mechanistic research around this. So this was a really interesting study that was published a number of years ago, um, published in the Journal of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine. And, and it was a small-scale study, but they took 14 people and they graded their aches and pains in general health for 28 days. Then they, then they supplemented with either up to 500 micrograms of molybdenum as an amino acid chelate per day or a placebo for the next 28 days. So they monitored them for 28 days, then they supplemented them with either molybdenum or with a placebo for 28 days, and then they had a washout period of 28 days after the fact. And so what, what these 14 people reported, you see here, their aches and pains improved on molybdenum. And this was a significant finding, meaning the p-value uh, was, was greater than 0 0.05, um, indicating again, that, that this was an effective trial. And then they also found that these individuals reported improvements in their general health being on molybdenum. So even beyond the joint pain, they, improved, they, they reported improvements in health. So um, this was just a, a pilot study. Again, we need more research to confirm, you know, does this happen across the board or, or are there particular types of arthritis that are more impacted or less impacted as a result of using molybdenum? Um, but nonetheless, molybdenum was very effective in this pilot study. Um, moving over here, part of that research, uh, part of what they think is happening, in other words, part of, there are several different mechanisms at play as to why they think uh, molybdenum supplementation can potentially reduce joint pain. Um, and one of them actually has to do with the function of the breakdown of aldehyde. So there are certain people um, when they're drinking alcohol, for example, or if they have a candida overgrowth. Remember, candida overgrowth can contribute to alcohol production in your gut. And that, you know, the metabolism or the breakdown of alcohol, part of that pathway, there's several enzymes involved with the breakdown of alcohol, but one of them is, um, is an enzyme that molybdenum runs, and that enzyme is called aldehyde, you see right here, aldehyde oxidase. So it plays a role in the breakdown of the byproducts of alcohol, and so some people, are, or some authors speculate that this is one of the mechanisms, um, and this is one of the reasons why people that drink a lot tend to develop more joint pain and have more joint pain and joint swelling. So there's one mechanism potentially that's being discussed in that regard. So another one of the mechanisms um, has to do with going back to the sulfites that we were discussing earlier. And beyond the fact that you know, things like wine and other alcoholic beverages can be preserved with sulfites, um, there's also speculation of excessive air pollution. So air polluted with sulfur dioxide, which is a common byproduct of our convenient lifestyles and the things that we do. There's sulfur dioxide that a lot of people get exposed to, and that sulfur dioxide can also contribute to the potential excess of sulfite buildup in the body. And again, remember going back to some of these symptoms of sulfite exposure is a long list, but swelling and, and joint pain and shortness of breath and asthma-like symptoms and dermatitis, et cetera, are all part of that. So these are just some of the mechanisms of why they think um, molybdenum is a, could be potentially effective in reducing joint pain. Now there's another element that I want to bring up 
on molybdenum and some of its impact and why we might think it could improve joint pain as well. And that has to do with the fact that molybdenum helps improve, so it improves, we th at least we think, it, or let's just say this, it corrects iron deficiency. Um, and so what, what happens, one of the functions of, you know, of molybdenum is here in this pathway, this xanthine oxidase pathway, there's some studies now showing that when xanthine oxidase is working well, in other words, you have enough, um, you have enough molybdenum driving that enzyme, well, in your liver, that's where a lot of that enzyme is and where that works. One of the things that it does is it takes ferritin, which is stored iron in the liver, and it breaks that ferritin out and it reduces it, making iron available to your bloodstream. And so this enzyme, this xanthine oxidase enzyme, is again, molybdenum is responsible for running it, so it helps to convert ferritin in your liver into iron and makes that iron accessible to your blood. And so this is why we see, or why we think we see that, that molybdenum can help correct stubborn iron deficiencies. Now where this may play a role for many of you, we see this a lot. Let's say you've been on iron supplementation um, and even to the point or to the level that maybe you've gone to the doctor and you're getting iron infusions because the iron supplement isn't working, this may be, um, this may be important for you to look at adding molybdenum to your regimen, to your supplement regimen to see if you can get better correction by activating the conversion of ferritin and freeing up that iron to be accessible to your bloodstream. Now, how does that relate to pain? Because if you don't have adequate iron in your blood, then one of the things that you're going to see happen is your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, and your red blood cell counts all go down. This is anemia. It's what we refer to as anemia. And so what happens with anemia? What are the symptoms of anemia? Potent particularly, we can get brain fog, fatigue, muscle, and joint pain are symptoms of anemia. Again, this is an oxygen deficiency is what happens because if you don't have enough red blood cells and enough hemoglobin in those red blood cells, then it's hard for your body to carry oxygen to your tissues. And when your tissues don't have oxygen delivered to them efficiently, they can't generate energy. And when they can't generate energy, and that happens in the muscle, you get pain in your muscle, you get pain in your joint. When it happens in your brain, you get fog and you get fatigue. So these are really common symptoms. Now, another symptom we sometimes see is shortness of breath, which interestingly enough is one of those symptoms we also saw with sulfite buildup. So not only does molybdenum metabolize that sulfite and potentially reduce uh, sulfite and do shortness of breath, but, sul uh, but molybdenum also drives this enzyme in your liver that helps prevent anemia from occurring, which is also a cause or a driving factor behind shortness of breath. So mechanistically speaking, molybdenum can improve your liver's ability to distribute stored iron into your bloodstream. And so if you've had a history of iron deficiency and it just won't correct, or anemia and it just won't correct as you're supplementing with iron or even as you're infusing with iron, you might want to talk with your doctor about adding molybdenum to see if that is playing a role. Now this is especially common or more common I have seen in patients with gluten sensitivity and people that have celiac disease because there's also a malabsorption issue as I mentioned earlier that's at play in this, uh, in this scenario.